If you've been playing the Tony Hawk games for a reasonable amount of time, you've probably come across a technique called a bonk, in which you ollie into some kind of railing, and all of your horizontal momentum is transferred into vertical momentum, and it gives you a lot of height. Now a lot of people know how to do this technique, but I don't really understand how this technique works or whether it was intended. So I'm going to be using a variety of debugging and reverse engineering techniques to try and answer some of these questions that I have. And just for reference, in case any of you don't know, here's a bonk. And here's what happens when you just ollie into the wall normally. So one of the best places to start uh, when trying to look into this kind of thing is the source code. And you might be thinking, how can you get the source code for, for Tony Hawk um, or Thug 2? It doesn't, you know, it's not released. It's a private, proprietary game. Neversoft wouldn't release that. Well, somehow, the Tony Hawk's Underground 1 source code was leaked online, and while that is questionable in terms of ethics, I think it's a useful resource for learning about these things and how the game works. So I'm going to be looking at it to try and uncover what, what's going on when a bonk occurs. Here we have the Thug 1 codebase, and if you've never seen it before, it's going to look quite daunting, but it's just a big chunk of C++, and it's not too bad to read once you start looking at it. As a matter of fact, I already know where this bonk code might be located, since I've been reading this code for a while. The majority of the physics code is inside a file called skitter core physics component. But there's two files here. Um, there's .h, which is a header file, and cpp, which is a source file. If you don't know C++, that's not a huge issue, but um, most of the juicy stuff is inside the CPP files. So this class, C Skater Core Physics Component, is responsible for most of the physics that happen when you're skateboarding in Thug 1 and Thug 2. There's going to be some slight differences in the Thug 1 and the Thug 2 code, but they're so slight and minimal uh, that it's not too much of an issue. And this is the best thing we can get because there's no Thug2 source code available anywhere. So you can see here there is an update function. Now this update function is called every frame and all of the physics are in here. You see if we're on the ground it does the ground physics, if we're in the air it does the air physics and so on and so on. And the thing we're interested in is the air physics because that's when a bonk happens. So we're going to go to do in air physics yeah, and essentially all the bonk stuff is going to be in here somewhere, and I actually have a, an idea of where it is already because I have done a bit of digging on this before, and there is a function called handle forward collision in air, which is responsible for, you guessed it, any collision that happens in the air, um, specifically in the direction that we're moving. One good thing to do to verify that this is the piece of code we want to be looking at is to use a debugger. And Cheat Engine, although it's associated with, you know, hacking some Flash games in your browser, is actually quite a powerful tool. Especially when we start looking into this memory view that, that exists here. We can, we can look at all the disassembly of the process and we can start to debug it. So with our debugger, what we can do is we can set a breakpoint and a breakpoint just means that when a certain piece of code is run, the code will stop running, it will pause. And we can set a breakpoint wherever we want. I'm going to set one at the very top of this function, just to verify that the game pauses at the correct time. And we would expect it to pause when we run into some kind of wall while we're in the air. So let's load a level. Um, Berlin. Berlin's a good level. And open the process in Cheat Engine. And you see here, all of this stuff just appeared. This is the disassembly of Thug Pro. And the disassembly is a slightly more human readable form of the code that's running inside the executable. It looks confusing. Honestly, I can barely read it. You know, I've, I've written a decent chunk of assembly code before, but I'm not the best at reading this. All that's important is that we set a breakpoint at the beginning of this function. Okay. But where is this function, you might be asking? Well, currently, from this, it's going to be impossible to find it. Because the names here, C Skater Core Physics Component, you know, handle forward collision in air, 
these things aren't going to be showing up. It's not like we can just search for this inside the disassembly. And the reason we can't do that is because this source code gets compiled into machine code and all of this unnecessary information like this is all lost. So if we don't know where this is going to be located in memory, this function, how do we find it? Luckily, there are other tools we can use. I'm going to be using a tool called IDA, which stands for the Interactive Disassembler, which is a static analysis tool that lets us find these things. IDA is a particularly useful tool because it lets us analyze binaries and annotate certain parts of them. So once we find where a function is located in memory, we can name the function and then we can look at it later. In the past, I've already gone through the binary and found a lot of these functions. If I type C scatter core physics component, you can see here there's a list of all the functions that I've already located in memory. And the one we are interested in is handle forward collision in error. So this is a slightly more visible form of the stuff that we could see inside Cheat Engine. We can see the assembly code, the disassembly here, but it's laid out in a graph view rather than just sequential text. And that's just so we can visualize the, um, the different branches that are possible from the code. And because we've mapped this function out in IDA, we can see the address that this is loaded into memory at. So if we copy this address and go to Cheat Engine, do control G, we can go to a certain memory address and you'll see right here this push minus one and then push uh, thug pro plus blah -de blah move EAX blah -de blah this will be the same code as here. This is the exact same code just written slightly differently and what we can do is we can debug and toggle a breakpoint and now anytime that that piece of code is run the game is going to pause which means that if we are to skate into a wall in the air, the game's going to pause. So let's try that now. Well, it paused a bit prematurely there, which is slight cause for concern. I wasn't expecting that, if I'm honest. So if we run, what happens? Aha! You'll see, every time I run, it runs for one frame, and then it stops. The reason that we're stepping frame by frame and constantly hitting this breakpoint is because this handle forward collision in air function is called once per frame every time that we're in the air regardless of whether we hit a wall or not. It's this function that checks for the collisions so it's important for us to only set the breakpoint only when we get a collision and if we look at the code we can see there's this call here this condition this if statement that says if get member failure collision you know if we've hit something then execute this code. What we can do is we can find this branching point in memory by looking at IDA and looking at the disassembly and then set a breakpoint there instead so that we only pause when we are hitting a wall rather than every single frame. You'll see that this if statement is called to determine whether we've hit something or not and if we've hit it, it executes all of this code. All of this code here all the way to the bottom. But if it doesn't hit a wall, it will immediately go to this return false, which means that it will exit from that function. So what we're looking for is part of this disassembly which suddenly jumps to the very end and returns. And it seems as though there's this branching point here. Yep, looks like we found it. You can see here at this address some kind of conditional is checked and then depending on that condition we either follow this green arrow all the way down here and go to the end of the function and return or we follow this red arrow and we enter this piece of code and start executing all this which looks exactly like the if statement at the top and we can verify this because we can see clearly that we're calling the get member failure collision function which is also being called here when doing the check because of this we know that if we get to this address in memory 50893e it means that a collision has occurred and that's where we want to set the breakpoint. So we'll get rid of this one, and go to this address, set a breakpoint, and now when we go back to the game, the game only pauses when we collide, like here. Yeah, perfect. By reading the source code, analyzing the disassembly, and setting breakpoints, we can slowly begin to tighten in on the area of code that we're interested in. So far the breakpoint triggers every time that we hit a wall while we're in the air but we need to refine that so that it only triggers when we're bonking. 
But where is the bonk code? You'll see there's quite a lot of code in here, and it's not immediately obvious what each part is doing, even though there's comments all over the place. So there's a couple of approaches we could take here. We could either set a bunch of breakpoints until we just get the right one by brute forcing it, or we could look at the code and try and understand what's going on. I'm going to opt for the second version because I believe that it's going to give us more intelligible results and we're going to be less frustrated. So there's a piece of code here that I find quite interesting. It says, we've hit a wall and we can't snap over it. See if we can just move up and go over it. And I wonder if this is related to bonking because when you bonk, you know, you go upwards. However, there's this thing here which says if def. And if you've written C++ before, you'll know that this is a preprocessor statement which says that if this symbol is defined, this code will end up in the binary. And if the symbol's not defined, this code doesn't actually exist. So I'm currently not sure if this code is in the final build or not, but we can have a look and see. And we can confirm that this snapping over thin walls code is included in the binary. Um, and we can see that by this git physics float call. You'll see that this number is used as an argument to the git physics float function. And here the exact same number has been pushed onto the stack and then the function has been called. So we know that this piece of code exists in the binary. Because we're using IDA, we can simplify things and help annotate the code by giving this number, by giving this value a name. And you'll see here that this thing is called physics air snap up. Now you don't need to understand quite what these numbers are. They are very dependent on the way that the Tony Hawk games work. The Tony Hawk games all have their own scripting engine and a lot of the symbols that are used inside the scripting engine are referred to by these 32-bit checksums. And now that we've created a name for that, we can annotate that here. And you'll see we're calling object git physics float with a parameter which is physics air snap up, which looks exactly like what we have here in the code. You'll see at the very end of this, the uh, Y position of the skater is updated. I think that this snapping effect is just going to instantly teleport your skater to a certain position. What we're really looking for is some kind of call that updates the velocity rather than the position because ultimately we're moving upwards, we're not snapping upwards. So this might not be the right piece of code to be looking at. So I went away for a couple of days and I did a bit more digging and I've discovered some pretty crucial things. The first thing I discovered was that the bonking code isn't actually in the handle forward collision and error function like I thought it might be. You'll see here in the do and error physics we call handle forward collision and error. After that there's some more stuff but there is another collision check here and this is the one that is responsible for bonking. And this collision check is slightly different. It's used for either landing on the floor or sliding across non-skatable surfaces like slopes. And it's actually the sloping code that's responsible for the bonking, in particular this line here. And this kind of leads me into something I'd like to mention about reverse engineering, and that is that you won't always get things right, but the important thing is that it's a continual learning process. So in the end, even though you get stuff wrong, it balances out and it's quite rewarding. So if we imagine that this box here is the skateboarder and this box here is a railing, we can visualize a bonk like so. So let's imagine that the skater is ollieing into this rail and they're going to bonk upwards when they hit it. When they're in the air, there are two forward collision checks that occur. The first one is handle forward collision in air, which shoots a ray from slightly above their feet in the direction that they're moving and if it hits a wall it will bounce them away. The skateboarder will bounce off the wall and it will play a sound effect as if they just hit the wall. The second collision check originates from the feet of the skateboarder and this collision check is very important for bonking and the reason that this collision check is very important is because if it hits a non-skatable surface like the side of this rail for example the velocity of the skater will be rotated along the wall or the plane of the surface that was collided with. So if we are ollieing into this and the the first collision check goes over the railing we won't be pushed away which means that the second collision check is going to hit into the side of this this railing here. So the first collision check will go over the railing, the second collision check that originates from the feet is going to hit into the railing and because the game registers the side of the railing as a non-scalable surface 
the skateboarder is going to have their velocity rotated along that surface and they're going to go upwards. So there we have it. Now you should have a decent understanding of why bonks work and why it's so important that you hit the top of a railing for a bonk to actually happen. I hope you enjoyed watching and let me know what you think. Alright, peace.